Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 6 of Arrow 4080. And today we're going to look at truss elements again, and we're going to extend their use into three dimensions. Okay, so we have a one-dimensional truss element that we're going to have placed in three space. Let's see how it works. So first of all, we can recall our basic one-dimensional truss element. We have the sign convention. We have our basic one-dimensional relations that relate our forces, our local forces, to our local displacements using the local stiffness matrix. Okay, this should be getting old hat by now. We've done this for one dimension, we've done it in two dimensions, and now we're going to do it in three dimensions. All right. So before we do that, we might drop back to statics where we looked at the direction cosines. Let's say we have a vector in three space, which means we have a three-dimensional coordinate system we can call it XYZ and we have this vector and if we take a look at that coordinate system and take a look at the vector from end to end we can see that this has X Y and Z dimensions okay a good way to describe this if the first point of the vector is X1 Y1 Z1 and the second point is X2 Y2 Z2 then we can define what the length in each direction in each direction is we have an x length a y length and a z length this one is moving in the positive x and the negative z in the positive y and the distance that's traveled is simply x2 minus x1 y2 minus y1 and z2 minus z1 with the total length of the vector being given with a root mean squared kind of thing okay we can express this as a vector by taking the magnitude and the relative lengths, where each relative length, the cosine of the theta that that vector makes with the x-axis is just the dimension, the x change over the total length and so on for each of the angles that this vector makes with each of the coordinate axes, okay? This means we can write it this way, we can write the unit vector either as those relative displacements or as the direction cosines, the cosine of theta x, cosine of theta y, cosine of theta z. Recalling that that unit vector, then the, mag the length of that has got to be 1. Okay, and we can see this little red vector over here. Let's look at that again. Here's another way of saying this same thing. If we have three space with a vector in three space, and let's just focus on that vector, this is obviously a different vector, then the angle that makes with the x uh, axis, this theta x is shown in the first picture to the left. The angle that vector makes with the y axis is shown here, and the vector that makes with the z axis is shown here. And an easy way of seeing this then is the cosine of each of those angles, just the direction or the dimension, that dx over d. The cosine of theta y is just dy over d, d is the total length, and cosine of theta z is just dz over d. The force, then, if that's a force vector, is just the x coordinate of the force, or the x component is just the magnitude of the force times cosine theta x and so on. With this as the unit vector, that's another way of writing it, okay? So we now have two ways of writing it. Now we're ready to look at the three-dimensional truss or a one-dimensional truss element in three space okay so let's just imagine our truss element remember it's a one-dimensional truss element the only stiffness it has is resisting axial movement that's the stiffness it has so we have a local coordinate system given with a u v and w primes and we have a global coordinate system u v and w or u corresponds with the X, uh, V corresponds with Y, and W corresponds with Z, or any other way we want to define that. Since our direction cosine, each direction cosine, C of X, is just the cosine of theta X and so on, we can write a 3D transformation vector using these direction cosines. This is relating our global X, Y, and Z, or U, V, and W, to our local uh, displacements. So you see, if we multiply this transformation vector times our global displacements, u, v, and w at end 1, and u, v, and w at end 2, we're going to get the two displacements of that truss element in local coordinates. 
if we define this little direction cosine transformation as t star 3, then we can write it this way, and we can transform our stiffness matrix into global coordinates from local to coordinate global coordinates, which means we take that little element stiffness matrix. This is we have a little local stiffness matrix for each element. It's a two by two for a truss element, right? Just a stiffness term for each end. And we're going to pre-multiply by T star 3 transpose times our KL of that element times our T3 star. That means we can take that 2 by 2 local stiffness matrix of the truss, multiply by the transformation in this way, and we're going to get the stiffness matrix of that element in global coordinates. What that's going to do, since this truss element only has stiffness in its local coordinate axial direction, that will transform that stiffness matrix so it tells exactly how much of that stiffness resists movement in the x, the global x, how much resists movement in the global y, and how much resists movement in the global z. And it's going to do that at both ends. So this means we can take this local stiffness matrix that we've been looking at since lecture two, and we can now pre and post multiply it by this transformation, and we're going to get the global element stiffness matrix. As soon as we have that, we're ready to assemble our global stiffness matrix. Now you can actually write the global stiffness matrix by just calculating this vector, where the first element, the 1, 1 element, is just the direction cosine of the x, c sub x squared, and so on. But it's actually better or more general to just focus on what is our local 2 by 2 element stiffness matrix. We'll pre and post multiply it by this relation, by our transformation, and then that will give us the global stiffness matrix. Now we, that we have that, once again, the terms of this going along the columns and then the rows, it's going to be at node 1 in the u, v, and x direction and then at node 2 in the u, v, and x. That's going to be for all columns and all rows. Having that, we now can assemble, once we look at, we identify what our global stiffness matrix is, we'll have element for grid 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on through our model. We'll have the x, y, and z coordinate for each node, and then we will assemble our matrix by plugging those into the right spot. Once we do that, we will impose our boundary conditions to eliminate any homogeneous constraints, any fixed nodes will be removed from our uh, system of equation, and any uh, enforced displacements will have to adjust the equation to decouple the matrix so we get a reduced stiffness matrix, and then we'll solve the reduced stiffness matrix, and then run that back through in the same manner we did before. Got that? Okay, if you like a baby step forward, okay. So, if we summarize our entire final element approach so far for truss elements in three dimensions, and this word rod is what Nastran uses to define these truss elements. Remember, a Nastran rod has not only axial stiffness, it also has torsional stiffness. Right now, our truss elements in this class so far, and from our textbook, is only resisting axial loads, no torsion. Okay, we're going to get to the beam element before we get that torsional stiffness. Once again, we're going to model our system by identifying all nodes and all elements. We'll then determine the local stiffness matrix for each and every element. This is what we have for a truss element. We're going to determine our transformation for each element, which means for each element, we're going to calculate the direction cosine of each. Remember the direction cosine, cosine c sub x is just cosine of theta x, which is just the change in length in the x divided by the total length of the element. The change in y divided by the total y, the change in z divided by the total length. Again, okay? So that's our transformation matrix. We construct that. Then we multiply for each and every local uh, stiffness matrix. We're going to multiply it pre and post multiply by the transformation matrix like this. Then we're going to assemble our global stiffness matrix. Once we do that, we're going to use our boundary, impose our boundary conditions, and write our system equations and impose our boundary conditions. Once we do that, we're then going to solve the system of equations with the displacements and the external forces 
for the reduced matrix. We then can multiply our global stiffness matrix times those displacements to get the remaining external forces. And now that we have that, we can take our global displacements and use that with each and every global element stiffness matrix to calculate the global forces in each element. We then can apply our transformation again, the other transformation, to get the local coordinates, the forces in local coordinates, from the forces in global coordinates for each and every element. Once we do that, we then compute our element stresses and local coordinates using either this or this. Okay? Once we've done that, we are ready to move forward. Okay, you got that? All right. Now, let's look at a couple example problems. So our first problem is ex uh, figure 317, example 3.8 from our text. We see we have one, two, three elements. Three of those nodes, uh, four nodes, three elements. Three of the nodes are pinned, which means we're going to... Uh, reduce our matrix for those and the last element we see we have a roller support which means it can't move in the let's see if we look at our coordinate system it cannot move in the y so we're going to remove the x y and z equations for nodes two three and four and for node one we're going to remove the equation the corresponding to motion in the y direction Okay, and that will allow us to move in the plane. That's going to allow us two degrees of freedom, right? So now we take a look at each of our nodes. These are all our local locations of each of the nodes. We can get our properties. So at node one, or excuse me, this is our element table. Element one goes from one to two. Element two goes to one to three and so on. We have the area of each, the E of each. And we can calculate the direction cosine, which means we take, if we look, for example, at element 1, the direction cosine should be this length. It looks like it's, uh, let's see, this node here is at, what, 72? So dx is 72 minus 0 over the length of that element. dy is going to be... That's going to be 0 minus 36 over the length of the element, and dz is 0. Okay, that we can use those then to calculate the three direction cosines. We can calculate the length by taking the sum of the root mean squares of those three lengths, and we can do that for the other elements. This gives us our transformation matrix. Okay, so if we continue on with our solution, we're going to apply the transformation matrix to each local stiffness matrix. That gives us a global stiffness matrix for each of our three elements. We then can construct our global stiffness matrix in this manner, and that should give us this guy. You'll notice the columns have been labeled, and the exact, if you take this column, take the transpose of that, that's going to be the labels for all of the rows as well. We can see node 1, 3 displacements, node 2, 3 displacements, node 3 displacements. We now can remove our homogeneous constraints, which means both the U, V, and W for nodes 2, 3, and 4, and the V for node 1. So we're going to get rid of element 4, element 3, element 2. 2, and then we're going to get rid of the y for the other element. Now you notice here this is not eliminated. We have one more we're missing. We also are getting rid of the y for element 1. So the second equation is also going to be the second row and second column is also eliminated. That's only going to give us two unknowns. Right? We're only going to have a, a u and a w displacement 
at node one. When we solve that system, we're going to get, we're going to use this equation to calculate the two displacements we don't know. We then are going to multiply that set of global displacements by a global stiffness matrix to get our external forces. This is showing us our reactions at each of the nodes at node one. We see what the applied forces are, right? At node two, at node three, and node four, what we have are the reactions. Are you with me? Okay. We then can calculate the uh, global, uh, the forces in the elements in global coordinates. That's what we're going to do here. And then calculate our stresses using one of those equations. Here's another example. This is a little one dimensional truss in three space. Once again, we're going to calculate all these things. Here is an echo of our four nodes. Here is our element conductivity followed by the properties followed by the direction cosines that we're going to calculate. And once again, C sub X for element one will be 12 minus zero divided by the length of the element. The element of the length of that element is just 12 minus zero squared plus minus three minus zero squared plus minus four minus zero squared. You take the square root of all that, that's the length of the element, and that's how you calculate your direction cosines. We then can construct our calculate our three global stiffness matrices by taking the local stiffness matrix and multiplying by our pre and post multiplying by our transformation. We then assemble our global stiffness matrix and once we do that we can start eliminating our homogeneous constraints which means that elements two three and four we're going to eliminate everything that's going to leave us three unknowns the dis three displacements at node one we can solve that system equation the reduced system equations to get our global displacements once we have those, we multiply them by our global stiffness matrix, the full global stiffness matrix to get our external forces. Once we have that, we take our external forces and we can use the displacements with the global stiffness matrix of each element to calculate the uh, element global forces, which we then can transform to calculate the element local forces which we then can use to calculate our stresses. And that's what those are. Make sense? Okay. Now let's just take a look at some uh, conceptual questions. For example, what is the difference between a 2D and a 3D analysis of spring and truss elements? All it is is more terms in the matrix. There's really no difference, okay? What mathematical concept is key to transforming our matrix? It's those direction cosines, which is just giving us our transformation matrix. Are you finding this material very learnable yet? Hopefully the answer to that is yes. And this is a joke. Okay. <laughs> so, this class is a lot of work. You should be strapped in. You should be implementing the homework, listening to lectures, getting to the point where you think you understand, going through and solving these and verifying that you understand. That's the way to master this class. You can do it. Okay? That's all I have for you. Enjoy.